And now I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Michael Howell. Uh, he received his medical degree from University of North Dakota and completed his neurology residency from University of Minnesota and his sleep medicine fellowship from Hennepin County Medical Center. Dr. Howell is a professor and the division head of sleep medicine in the Department of Neurology and dedicated to developing novel strategies to improve brain function and sleep health. He's also the director of the sleep performance training for athletes program at M Health Fairview, helping elite athletes and sport teams to optimize their performance through better sleep and circadian health. Um, he's also the vice chair for education and faculty affairs in the Department of Neurology. Um, Dr. Howell's research interests include characterizing the relationship between sleep and neurological disorders and determining whether these processes are reversible with current or experimental therapies. His research is funded by the National Institutes for Health and current projects include sleep in neurodegenerative disease such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, the development of novel treatments for hypersomnias, including narcolepsy and related conditions, and the development of novel strategies to improve the sleep health for organizations and populations. We're very fortunate to have you here, Dr. Howell. Thank you for being with us. And without further delay, I would like to hand it over to you to share your talk on paradox lost and found, the discovery and management of RVD. There you go. Thank you, Dr. Thapa. I am honored to be here. <clears throat> Let's just go ahead and jump right into it. So uh, I have no uh, relevant disclosures uh, or uh, conflicts of interest uh, to mention. Uh, we will talk briefly about treatments for REM sleep behavior disorder, all of which are off-label. There, <clears throat> there are no FDA approved treatments for REM sleep behavior disorder. Um, let's just start here uh, with a uh, email I received <clears throat> from a patient after I did a local media appearance and I'll just go ahead and read it. Dear Dr. Howell, I have woken to my very tall, muscular husband kneeling over me, choking me. Thankfully, I could get in a scream. There have been other instances where he has punched me in the face. We've even discussed what would happen if he hurt me badly in his sleep, how he would be able to explain it to the police that he did it in his sleep. Please, any information would be greatly appreciated. I have loved this man since high school. I can't bear the thought of watching him suffer with Parkinson's disease. Okay. We'll get back to that. The story of REM sleep behavior disorder is best thought of as part of the book of our understanding sleep over the last century. Uh, so <clears throat> worthwhile to remember that the EEG, the workhorse for polysomnography is a hundred years old now. Um, Hans Berger's uh, early studies were in 1923. So uh, there were early studies that Dr. Berger did uh, on sleep and noted that during wakefulness, there was a period of uh, <clears throat> low amplitude, high frequency activity. And this alternated with sleep, with uh, the uh, slow wave activity that we're very familiar with uh, when we look at N3 uh, stages of sleep. REM sleep was not discovered at this time. <clears throat> It's worthwhile to, uh, to remember that for most of human history, there has been a close relationship between uh, the perception of sleep and death. Uh, for many uh, cultures and many religions, the idea uh, of uh, sleep and death being closely related is still uh, very much in vogue. There is uh, often a sense we often console those who are grieving with the idea that their loved one uh, is sleeping. Uh, and here's a, a picture of uh, uh, Thanatos and Hypnos, uh, Brothers of uh, Death and Sleep uh, by John William Waterhouse in 1874. Um, in terms of the high amplitude, slow wave activity, of course, we're talking about deep non-REM sleep. We're talking about slow wave sleep, which was what was originally discovered <clears throat> by Hans Berger. Uh, what do we know um, about what's happening during these different stages of sleep? Well, uh, during slow wave sleep, there's almost certainly numerous <clears throat> functions that are occurring, most notably uh, synaptic homeostasis and, and glymphatic clearance. Uh, how, to, how to conceptualize synaptic homeostasis? Uh, a, a reasonable way to think about it is, remember your brain, an adult brain, has 100 billion neurons and about, give or take, 100 trillion with a T uh, synapses. Uh, and that these are constantly being created uh, during wakefulness through a process called long-term potentiation. 
And <clears throat> synapses are uh, very much in a Darwinian struggle um, to uh, create new connections uh, in your brain while you are awake. Unfortunately, after your fontanelles fuse at about six to eight months of age, uh, there's no more room inside your skull for more synapses to form. So there, you need a process <clears throat> in which the brain can routinely downscale the synapses and prevent that um, just unalterated, unchecked uh, growth of synaptic activity. Uh, and this is very analogous to computer file compression. This happens uh, during slow wave sleep, in particular, the frequency of slow waves and the milieu of neurotransmitters, in particular, the drop of norepinephrine that occurs in uh, slow wave uh, during slow wave sleep, promotes uh, deep potentiation. So during <clears throat> wakefulness, the, the synapses are being created uh, through potentiation, and during slow wave sli sleep, they are being deep potentiated. They are being pruned. <clears throat> This is incredibly helpful. Um, there, this results in incredible energy savings uh, because up to 80% of brain activity is related to synaptic activity. So if you have fewer synapses, um, you have uh, more energy savings. It saves space. Uh, and then it, it promotes memory and lear learning because it prevents uninterrupted potentiation uh, and it increases signal to noise uh, activity. And the, I like to think of it as it basically creates a healthy Darwinian reaction uh, where uh, synapses that are consistently used and consistently reinforced stay because uh, the weaker synapses that are not being frequently used are being depotentiated away uh, during slow wave sleep. <clears throat> In addition to that, uh, as uh, many of you are aware, it is also very clear that during slow wave sleep is, is incredibly important for the promotion of glymphatic clearance. Uh, and this has growing importance in our field, particularly how it applies to the importance for sleep for the prevention of neurodegenerative diseases, such as Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. <clears throat> it's, it's amazing that for most of my career, um, we did not really have a good understanding of how toxins uh, and metabolic waste products were cleared out of the brain. The lymphatic system, uh, does not extend into the central nervous system. And it was only a little over a decade ago in a publication in Science uh, where it was where it was made clear that it is during uh, sleep that there is a uh, there is clearance of uh, brain toxins, metabolic waste products through the glymphatic system. So uh, the uh, glial cells, not the neurons, but the glial cells, astrocytes in the brain create these uh, foot channels, uh, around veins and venules. Uh, and what happens is it is those channels that basically uh, create uh, the brain's version of the lymphatic system. Uh, but as it turns out, there's very little <clears throat> lymphatic flow when you're awake because uh, the, of all the space that's needed for brain activity. It is during slow wave sleep <clears throat> that neurons shrink by about 30% increase inter interstitial space, and then their pulsations from your uh, CNS arteries, from the arteries in your brain, create these flows of uh, cerebral spinal fluid uh, that clear out um, toxins during, particularly during slow wave sleep. Um, and just a reminder, <clears throat> this is just a little animatic of the progression of amyloid pathology, in particular Alzheimer's disease, uh, which results in an accumulation of, of uh, insoluble beta amyloid uh, as well as uh, tangles and tau uh, proteins. It's, this is very similar to what is happening during Parkinson's disease. It's just a different accumulation, uh, which is alpha-synuclein pathology. Um, this is a, a very helpful uh, slide that was shared with me by uh, Jeff Illiff, who was at Oregon Health Sciences University, but I now believe he is at the University of uh, Washington in Seattle. Uh, and what I'll just draw your attention to uh, is uh, is the middle uh, is the middle bar here, and what you're seeing is <clears throat> you're seeing our pulses of cerebral spinal fluid uh, that are washing away um, uh, various metabolic waste products that are building up uh, during wakefulness. Uh, and so, uh, a reasonable way to think about slow wave sleep, at least lymphatic clearance, is that in, when you combine it with um, synaptic depotentiation, is this is a way. 
uh, for your brain to wipe the back the blackboard um, clean of information that is uh, not particularly salient or relevant uh, for survival. All right, but what about that's that's non-REM sleep, which was the uh, first uh, significant state of sleep that was discovered. But what about dreams? Um, dreams are inherently fascinating. They've obviously been the source of a tremendous amount of art um, and uh, religiosity over the history of human uh, civilization. Uh, but wh where are they coming from and, and, and um, what do we know about them? Well, uh, it wasn't until uh, uh, Nathaniel Kleitman and um, Azar Eugene Azarinsky at the University of Chicago um, demonstrated uh, the, that uh, and identified the presence of REM sleep as the source of dreams uh, that we were able to uh, disrupt the uh, cultural zeitgeist that uh, dreams were uh, the source uh, of superstition and instead place them firmly in the firmament of uh, scientific discovery. Um, and uh, Nathaniel Kleitman uh, uh, and uh, his grad student, uh, Eugene Azarinsky, uh, published their findings in 1953, <clears throat> where they noted uh, very fast darting psychotic eye movements, the rapid eye movements of uh, REM sleep, uh, combined with very wake-like EEG activity. Uh, and this was later named paradoxical sleep because uh, the patient is clearly behaviorally asleep. Uh, they have a species-specific sleep posture, uh, but the uh, EEG is very consistent with wakeful activities. <clears throat> of note, uh, they did not have the funding to uh, have continuous EEG monitoring throughout the whole night, so it was often spot-checked. Um, and uh, the idea of the ultradian sleep cycle that we're very familiar with every 90 minutes going through uh, N1, 2, 3, followed by REM sleep, that was not discovered until um, uh, Nathaniel Kleitman and his later um, uh, uh, trainee, uh, uh, William DeMent, discovered the sleep cycle in 1957, again at the University of Chicago. And of course, what we're talking about here is we're talking about REM sleep. Um, and so REM sleep is referred to as paradoxical sleep, very intense dream mentation, often combined with very intense uh, emotional and limbic activation. And this is particularly helpful for the uh, reactivation of, of uh, emotionally salient experiences and memories. Um, and so the vast majority of what we experience throughout the course of the day is meaningless. Uh, it has uh, almost no survival um, benefits for us to retain a tremendous amount of information that we see and perceive and make synaptic connections over. Uh, however, those experiences that have an incredibly intense emotional connection to them uh, provide uh, a way of informing our brain that this particular information uh, is relevant and, and very likely helpful for survival. Um, <clears throat> and so it's not a it's not a, it's not an evolutionary accident that the hippocampus and the memory circuit uh, is incredibly, it shares a tremendous amount of uh, territory uh, with the emotions and limbic cir circuit circuitry. Um, much of this work was done by uh, Michelle Jouvet, um, who did a significant amount of work uh, doing lesions on cats. Um, and this is a nice description on the top left is a cat in uh, non-REM sleep. I'm sure we've all seen cats uh, resting something somewhat like this. Uh, and uh, in the bottom left, you can see a cat in REM sleep. The difference, obviously, is uh, that the cat on the bottom is not able to maintain posture. They are atonic. Uh, so this is a, a reasonable way to spot what stage of sleep your cat is in uh, when your cat is sleeping. Um, over the course of the last of the next uh, several decades, we've uh, gone quite a long ways in terms of understanding what exactly is the circuitry that controls REM sleep, uh, not only in cats, but also um, in uh, rats and later in humans. It's a, it's a very complicated circuit. I would draw your attention to a couple particularly um, important areas, particularly the locus ceruleus, um, uh, as well as the uh, uh, pedunculopontine nucleus and the lateral dorsal tegmental nuclei. Uh, but in addition to that, there's numerous other um, nuclei and circuits that are particularly relevant. Um, I'm sure as many of you have recognized, there is a very 
Uh, interesting relationship between antidepressant medications and REM sleep behavior disorders, in particular, those with a very intense S, uh, serotonergic uh, activation. And it's it's uh, relevant there that the Raffaei nuclei, which is a serotonergic nuclei, is activates uh, the REM off circuit. So in, in this schematic, uh, the red nuclei are the uh, REM off uh, nuclei and the green nuclei are the REM on nuclei. Uh, and for reasons uh, that we're still trying to figure out where exactly is the lesion uh, that causes REM sleep behavior disorder, it's probably not one in particular, uh, but the sublateral dorsal nucleus I, appears to be particularly relevant. Uh, it's Most uh, pathology with REM sleep behavior disorder, of course, comes from the progression of alpha-synuclein Lewy body disease type pathology, and uh, the pathology as it ascends uh, frequently in through the pons and through the brainstem uh, in, among individuals is often quite diffuse throughout this circuit. Uh, but this is just uh, one example uh, from uh, in Brad Bovet's publication um, about 15 years ago now, uh, indicating that uh, the lesions uh, in the sublateral dorsal nucleus uh, do lead to increased motor activity, uh, particularly during REM sleep. Um, just so briefly, REM sleep paralysis uh, is uh, very well uh, characterized and has been known for a long period of time. Uh, a significant amount of artwork characterizes uh, the Atonian terrifying nature of REM uh, sleep uh, paralysis as well as uh, sleep-related hallucinations. Um, <clears throat> but it wasn't until Michel Jouvet came along uh, with his uh, feline lesion experiments that was able to demonstrate where exactly in the brainstem this is occurring uh, by identifying the uh, pontine circuitry. Uh, this uh, video uh, kindly comes to us from uh, Dr. Alon Avedon uh, at UCLA, which nicely demonstrates um, um, a cat who has lost REM atonia and so then is able to act out their dreams. So of course, during REM sleep, we're normally paralyzed uh, which uh, certainly serves a very important purpose of allowing our brain to go through all of the processes and functions of REM sleep, uh, by, but also having our skeletal musculature essentially offline. Uh, and you can see here what happens when an animal uh, does not have that. This remarkable film shows a cat in the middle of a night's sleep. Now, believe it or not, the cat is still asleep. But because some of its nerve pathways have been cut, it's acting out its dreams. Normally, when we dream, we're effectively paralyzed from the neck down. But that paralysis has been bypassed in this cat. Its brain shows all the signs of REM sleep, but its muscle activities suggest an exciting dream life chasing flies and mice. If our muscles weren't paralyzed, we too would probably act out our dreams in this way. Perhaps it's fortunate for our partners that we don't. Okay, so that's a good that's a good jump forward. So we had this understanding through animal lesion experiments in the 1960s that it is possible to lesion upon still survive uh, and have a loss of REM atonia, but otherwise preserved REM sleep. Uh, which then begs, begged the question at the time was, well, are there any examples of uh, human beings who've had this loss of their paradox? So they, paradoxical sleep, of course, is, is REM sleep. Uh, can, you, can you lose uh, the atonia? Uh, and are there any human examples uh, of that? Well, as it turns out, throughout antiquity, there's been numerous reports of dream enactment. Um, numer uh, probably one of the best examples is uh, from Cervantes, um, uh, and Don Quixote <laughs> described the following uh, for an individual who was uh, sleeping in the middle of the night. He was thrusting his sword in all directions, speaking out loud as if he were actually fighting a giant. And the strange thing was that he did not have his eyes open because he was asleep and dreaming that he was battling the giant. He had stabbed the wineskins, believing that he was stabbing the giant and that the entire room was filled with wine. And there are numerous other examples very similar to this. And for those of us who have been taking care of REM sleep behavior disorder, it's it's incredible how prevalent this condition is. Um, 
Uh, but jumping forward to uh, September of 1982 in Minneapolis, where my uh, mentor, Carlos Schenk, um, who is still uh, actively practicing and still very engaged with um, the REM Sleep Behavior Disorder Research Committee community, uh, was having his very first day in his sleep clinic. He was a junior faculty member. Uh, there was a sleep center uh, run by the neurology department, and they were asking uh, for a psychiatrist because they had numerous patients who they thought would benefit from psychiatric care. Um, and uh, Carlos was the junior person in the department, had just been hired. No one else wanted to do it, so they sent Carlos uh, to clinic. And uh, true story, uh, the second patient he ever saw in his first clinic was the index case of REM sleep behavior disorder, which is just amazing. Um, and this was a 68-year-old male uh, who was dreaming uh, that he was playing North American rules football. He, was, he weighed probably all of 60 kilograms, uh, but he was dreaming that he was a National Football League linebacker and he was jumping out of bed. Um, and um, the uh, patient underwent a sleep study where uh, he um, was uh, the patient and the sleep study was also reviewed by another mentor of mine, Dr. Mark Mahold, uh, who died in uh, 2020, uh, and very importantly by a uh, sleep technologist who helped found the American Academy of Sleep Technologists, uh, uh, Andrea Patterson. The three of them spent much of the morning looking at the paper uh, and VCR taped recordings. And uh, we came to the conclusion that what they were looking at was indeed an example of Juvet's, a human example of Juvet's cats, meaning that this person was not awake uh, and, uh, and disoriented or delirious, but instead this person was clearly in REM sleep. They had just lost uh, their REM atonia. Uh, and this is, uh, this is Carlos here from a video recording made back in the late 1980s. It's an incredibly important historical video of RBD. This is the very first four patients uh, uh, with uh, REM sleep behavior disorder. So I'll go ahead and play. It may be a little loud. My apologies. I, I can pull the volume down here a little bit. of medicine concerned with unusual sleep behaviors. Before we learn more about this condition called the rapid eye movement sleep behavior disorder, let me ask you, the viewer, how you would react upon hearing that a man was regularly punching and kicking his wife at night in bed while dreaming that he was being attacked and fighting to save his life. Oh, medicine sorry about that. Him, My tied fault. himself by a rope to the bedpost every night for eight years to keep him from leaping out of bed and becoming injured during violent nightmares. And what if other patients mention that they usually retire at night to a sleeping bag or to a padded water bed in order to protect themselves and bed partners from their wild dream-acting behaviors. What explanations come to mind to account for such bizarre nocturnal events? As it turns out, there is a medical cause and a simple and safe medical treatment for this type of striking, dangerous sleep problem. Since 1982, for the past five years, during the course of routine clinical practice as physicians, we have evaluated 30 patients afflicted with the rapid eye movement sleep behavior disorder. This condition has received official recognition by the Association of Sleep Disorder Centers. These 30 patients, usually very calm and pleasant middle-aged or older men without psychiatric disorder, presented for help on account of violent dream and acting behaviors during sleep, which resulted in numerous injuries to themselves and their spouses, for up to 20 years before the sleep problem was understood and proper treatment initiated. Their injuries included bone fractures, lacerations requiring stitches, and deep bruises. Many had been previously misdiagnosed by their physicians to have a psychiatric disturbance or epilepsy, and at times some received extensive therapy for these presumed disorders. That last point is particularly relevant because you can't overstate how common people imagine there's some deep underlying psychological conflict that these people are going through. That's completely wrong. There's absolutely, well, I mean, they, they don't they don't have anything more wrong with them than the rest of us do. They just are not able to paralyze their musculature uh, during REM sleep. Um, the Carlos and Mark collected uh, for the original paper in 1986 in sleep, I believe it was six subjects. So it took them four years 
uh, to collect six subjects, just kind of people walking in through the door of the sleep center. Then they published their result, and then within the next year, they had 30 more. So this was this was a situation where individuals were struggling with this. There are people out there in our communities right now who are struggling with dream enactment with their bed partners. They have no idea what to do. Um, fortunately, this condition is better understood now than it used to be. Uh, but still, there's a tremendous number of people who talk to their primary care providers who just genuinely don't know what to do with these patients. Um, and they oftentimes come to the conclusion, that, well, they maybe they're depressed, maybe they have something, maybe it's stress, um, when in fact, what they have is they have a sleep disorder where they can't paralyze their uh, musculature, and we just need to help them with that. All right. So of course, we're talking about REM sleep here for REM sleep behavior disorder. Uh, here's a more uh, recent uh, example. This is a patient of mine, just to illustrate how severe this can be. This uh, individual uh, came to see me <clears throat> after he had broken his pelvis. So he had, uh, he was dreaming, this is this study was done several months later, uh, but he had been dreaming that he was swimming in a swimming pool and he was going to do a, can he tried to do a cannonball off of his bed uh, and he landed on the floor of his bedroom and broke his pelvis. He was uh, obviously taken to the emergency department, a trauma center, uh, orthopedic surgeons did a wonderful job uh, uh, fixing his pelvis. Guess what nobody bothered to ask, which is why in the world uh, did an individual jump out of bed? If you read the admission note for this patient, it was patient fell out of bed. Uh, it wasn't until they had gone through all of their rehab, gone back to their primary care doctor. Their primary care doctor asked the question, what happened? The patient said, oh, I was dreaming, I was swimming, and I did a cannonball off out of the bed. And this very astute primary care doctor said, well, that's not normal. Uh, you need to go in and see a sleep physician. So uh, this is this is an example of uh, and the patient is a retired police officer, uh, and this is an example of uh, he was dreaming that he was approaching some suspects on the other side of a hedge, and he had this uh, non-lethal kind of flash incapacitating device. So this was all you know imaginary, uh, but you can see him um, approach some suspects in his mind anyway as he's sleeping. He's just swearing a little bit. <clears throat> he can't hear that. He said, hey, Peckerhead, there you are. And so the next morning, the sleep technologist showed this to him. He said, oh, yeah, I was dreaming that there were these suspects on the other side of this hedge, and I was throwing over something to incapacitate them so I could arrest them. Um, uh, more often than not, it's actually not that dramatic, though, as for those of us who take look at PSGs frequently. It's, um, it's often just you want to see the hands, if you can get the hands, if the hands are available. And you can see on this individual's left hand, there's the oximeter probe, which is glowing slightly. And what you see is you just see this little bit of motor activity frequently in the hands. Um, and I and it's I, I like to call it, we call it hand babbling. It's like they're, they're almost uh, doing sign language or pointing or using a cursor for a mouse um, or tapping through a smartphone. But that's that's what it looks like when it's when it's subtle. Um, needless to say, this can be quite injurious. We have numerous uh, pictures of this is what limbs look like when they go through uh, plate glass windows. Uh, the, the, both of these patients have REM sleep behavior disorder, and, and they gave us permission to use these uh, photos that obviously had their likely, um, you can recognizable, uh, but we can use these for educational purposes. Uh, the, 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 both, both of these patients um, have REM sleep behavior disorder themselves. The woman on the left uh, was dreaming that she was on a raft that was being shoved away from shore. And so she had to jump back off of the raft onto the shore. She jumped out of bed head first into a dresser. She has a basilar skull fracture, broken maxilla, broken nose and chipped teeth. Patient on the right uh, is a patient of mine 
with uh, obstructive sleep apnea in addition to REM sleep behavior disorder. And he dove out of bed and you can see his left eye uh, became impaled upon the power cord from a CPAP machine into a power strip. Uh, he was nearly fully enucleated and still to this day has lost the vast majority of his vision in his left eye. So this is a very serious condition. And it's a serious condition even for individuals who have relatively rare dream enactment. So it's, it's a very difficult condition to take care of because you can have somebody who's otherwise doing well um, and decides not to treat it, which is, which is, which is reasonable, by the way, um, in many cases, but can sporadically and, and often with very little insight as to when it's going to happen, have it really concerning injurious behavior. All right. So um, the discovery of REM sleep behavior disorder, this fascinating, relatively common condition, 1% of the human population. So that's 80 million people worldwide, over 3 million people in the United States um, that is treated with either high dose melatonin or low dose clonazepam. In addition to that, um, our task force from the AASM recently also supported the use of um, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, such as uh, rivastigmine and denepazil. Um, I, I tend to use denepazil because it's less expensive, it's available um, generically. But in addition to that, um, the, the next thing uh, Carlos and Mark did watching very, their patients very closely is they know that a large number of them I, in within the first 10 years, it was 33% of individuals developed a neurodegenerative disorder. Uh, in particular, those with alpha synuclein pathology, uh, Parkinson's disease, dementia with Lewy bodies, as well as multiple system atrophy. So this was their original um, series of 29 subjects. Um, and after 16 years of follow-up, they had an 81% conversion rate. Uh, a more accurate uh, number, I think, with, that we can cite for patients uh, moving forward, or at least um, a more recent number, data comes from Ron Postuma and uh, Mc, uh, McGill's. Uh, but this was, this was not just um, a Montreal study. This was uh, numerous centers uh, demonstrate a 74% phenol conversion at 12 years. Worthwhile to point out that as we're getting a better job of identifying these patients early and earlier, it's very likely that the window of time that we're going to see them prodromal is going to get wider and longer. Um, and for, you know, when you have the conversation with these patients, you know, they, they often will do their own internet searching and they're like, well, my goodness, I, you know, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to have Parkinson's disease within 10 years or 15 years. And I would say not necessarily. I, you know, in, the, in, ad in addition to that, there are numerous individuals who go much, much longer than a decade or two, and we are getting better and better at identifying these people early. So I think it's very difficult. Um, and I, and I think, um, I, I, I think, I think great caution needs to be taken uh, before we cite anything in terms of the a patient's risk. There are a few things that we can do that are particularly helpful. You can ask them a few questions, very straightforward questions. Ask them, how is their sense of smell? Ask them if they have constipation. <clears throat> ask them if uh, they have orthostasis. For men, ask them if they have erectile dysfunction. All of these are very consistent with the autonomic dysfunction that comes along with early prodromal pathology of these conditions. So, um, so for example, if you have someone with REM sleep behavior disorder, but they still smell fine, uh, they are not constipated, they, they don't have orthostasis or ED, um, I, I provide as much reassurance as I can. Look, you, you do not appear to have, um, compelling evidence of a larger syndrome at play here. And let's keep an eye on this. Um, this is, uh, a marker of likelihood ratios. Um, so likelihood ratio, uh, means that if it's more than 1.0, um, you are, you have an increased likelihood of having that. Um, with whatever risk factor we are referring to having a condition. This is likelihood ratio for uh, Parkinson's disease. Uh, and you'll note just, if you take a look at the left-hand column here of positive likelihood ratios, uh, men have a likelihood ratio of 1.2 for Parkinson's disease compared to women. So slight increase, nothing dramatic. Um, uh, if you take a look at uh, other 
uh, risks that we know are related to Parkinson's disease risks, such as uh, regular pesticide exposure. Did you grow up on a farm? Occupational solvent exposure. Uh, that has a likelihood ratio of 1.5. If you have um, a family member who had Parkinson's disease under the age of 50, that's a likelihood ratio of 7.5. Uh, jumping down here, if you had a DAT scan uh, that was positive, uh, you have a likelihood ratio of 40, all of which pales in comparison to the likelihood ratio of sleep study confirmed REM sleep behavior disorder of 130 which really illustrates how what how tightly correlated this condition is with neurodegeneration, however. All right. Um, worthwhile to point out, and I promise I will finish, I promise I'll finish on time. Um, worthwhile to point out, if you go back and read, and I invite for anyone who's interested, it's this is very easy to find. If you just Google or do an internet search for uh, an essay on the shaking palsy, uh, by James Parkinson's original monograph of six patients with um, what would later be called Parkinson's disease. Uh, in addition to noted describing the tremor and bradykinesia, <clears throat> uh, he described a tremendous amount of sleep problems in these patients, in particular, case six. C case six with Parkinson's, he described the following. The sleep becomes much disturbed. This tremulous motion of the limbs occur during sleep and augment until they awaken the patient and frequently with much agitation and alarm. When exhausted nature seizes a small portion of sleep, the motion becomes so violent as not only to shake the bed hangings, but even the floor and the sashes of the room. So clearly this was an individual who had REM sleep. I mean, that's, 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 I'm about as certain of that as I can be of anything, which is that this person with Parkinson's disease also had uh, REM sleep behavior disorder described in the very first description of Parkinson's disease. Um, this uh, is a very uh, classic uh, picture by uh, Charcot in the late 19th century, uh, who, who was the one who gave it the term Parkinson's disease, by the way. Um, it's worthwhile to point out that not all patients with Parkinson's disease have REM sleep behavior disorder. In fact, it's probably a minority. It's a pretty significant minority, but it's a minority. It's about probably about 40% of patients with Parkinson's disease have REM sleep behavior disorder. However, they tend to have the more aggressive disease. They tend to have higher severity scores, which is the Hohn and Yar score. They have greater motor fluctuations. You have more difficulty getting them under control with levodopa therapies, more cognitive decline, hallucinations, and autonomic instability. In addition to that, Parkinson's disease is often pretty effectively uh, delineated into two groups, meaning those who have very compelling and distressing tremor and those whose tremor is just not that predominant. Well, REM sleep behavior disorder is much more common and likely to manifest among the non-tremor predominant Parkinson's disease patients. Uh, in particular, they often have gait freezing uh, and postural instability. And postural instability, we check in clinic by just having someone stand um, or, uh, upright and suddenly from the back or from the forward, we suddenly perturb their um, uh, perturb them to see if they're able to uh, stay standing and not fall over. Uh, this, of course, per careful, you need to be extremely careful with this because because people often will have no writing response and you have to catch someone who may be you know 240 pounds coming down like a like a tree. Um, here's a, for those of you who are not familiar with gait freezing, here's a pretty effective uh, video um, that I think shows what gait freezing looks like. It's often people have trouble with initiating gait, turning, and crossing thresholds, like such as a doorway. And what, what patients will say is that there is a sense that their foot is glued to the floor. Here's another, here's an example of a turning freeze. And sometimes it's really quite subtle. You can also notice the decreased arm swing in the right hand.
Okay. Well, as it turns out, there is a significant overlap, particularly in the PPN, the, the, the uh, peduncular pontine nuclei that controls both loco locomotor pattern generation, um, which we suspect is the source cause of the freezing problem, as well as uh, inhibits the REM off cycle, which can, can con contribute to REM sleep behavior disorder. Um, amazingly, uh, James Parkinson in the same monograph with the same subject described gate freezing. So th this, the following is from the same case who had the evidence of the dream enactment. Uh, if whilst walking, he felt much apprehension from the difficulty of raising his feet. If he saw a rising pebble in his path, he avowed in a strong ma manner his alarm on such occasions. And it was observed by his wife that she believed that in walking across the room, he would consider as a difficulty the having to step over a pin. So the, the relationship between RBD, non-tremor predominant P PD, and gate freezing is all right there in the very first monograph of uh, Parkinson's disease over 200 years ago. Um, just a couple things that we are working on. Um, uh, my, co my colleague, Colin Mc McKinnon, is we're taking individuals with Parkinson's disease either who have um, RBD um, or don't. We also are taking individuals who don't have Parkinson's disease, but just have REM sleep behavior disorder uh, and normal controls and looking at their ability to anticipate postural adjustments. Um, oh, just this is just a reminder of the neurodegenerative risk of RBD. And what, what, column, what column has uh, identified is that, so when you, the next time, the next time you stand up, um, you, you, when, you, when you step forward, what's very interesting is, so if you're gonna, if you're planning on stepping forward with your, um, with this foot, which is my right, if you're stepping forward with your right foot, the first thing that actually happens is, is you actually push down on that to move your body weight over to the other side. That doesn't happen with Parkinson's disease. What happens is basically an individual just falls forward, which is one of the reasons why they're at such high risk of falling is because they don't have controlled gait initiation. And what Column has been able to demonstrate is that we, with, um, we have a motion capture unit and a, and a, a mocap, a video motion capture um, laboratory. And we're able to detect even in people who are otherwise have appear to have normal gait, they haven't had any fall problems. We can demonstrate that they're actually not uh, anticipating uh, the necessary postural adjustments for gait, um, even long before they ever anyone ever develops um, Parkinson's disease. Uh, in addition to that, this is a study we just were awarded um, a National Institutes for Aging study is taking a look at individuals who have REM sleep behavior disorder from a serotonergic antidepressant. So the SSRIs, fluoxetine, sertraline, escitalopram, all of the common uh, SSRI medications, which we know are likely to, are, we know they can increase an individual's risk for having uh, REM sleep behavior disorder. The question is, is this just a toxic response from the serotonin or are these individuals who have been unmasked? They they really are in their 30s or 40s. Um, you give them Prozac, you give them sertraline, you give them Zoloft, and now all of a sudden they start acting out their dreams. Is that just a toxic response from the medication? Or did the medication just demonstrate in this individual who otherwise would have developed RBD 10, 20 years later? Um, and um, so what we do amongst, okay, I just mentioned that. Um, so these, are, these, these people are usually younger. So the RBD patients are typically in their 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, these patients with serotonergic RBD are usually younger uh, in uh, middle, a younger middle age. Uh, and what we, this is, this is our proposal. The idea that um, uh, serotonergic RBD is an even earlier prodromal uh, stage of Lewy body pathology. And we are doing uh, cutaneous uh, pathological testing. So you can take a skin biopsy and you can, you can detect early alpha synuclein pathology in the uh, nerves to the sweat glands in the skin. We also have ultra high field uh, seven Tesla MRI scanners. Most clinical MRI scanners are three Tesla. This is a seven Tesla magnet. So um, 
you know, be careful with anything metal on you when you walk into the room. Uh, and we're doing that, that on individuals to measure um, changes in uh, brainstem um, circuitry. And then in addition to that, we're taking a look at um, a voc unique speech signs so we can record voice and actually identify if there's any vocal changes <clears throat> that would suggest of, of uh, impending Parkinson's disease. Uh, and, it, and then in addition to that, there's also the NAP study, the North American Prodromal Synuclonopathy Study. For, so for, if any of you have any patients who are interested in participating in um, a large prospective clinical study of REM sleep behavior disorder, whether or not it's due to medications or not, uh, the NAP study is the, is the study to take a look at. You can just do an internet search for NAPS RBD. Oh, and this is um, some of our preliminary um, skin biopsy data. So these are all, these are all individuals who have a REM sleep behavior disorder from different um, antidepressant medications, and they too also appear to have uh, synuclein pathology in their skin. Uh, and here's some uh, MRI, seven Tesla MRI data indicating that we can actually identify uh, that locus ceruleus, sub ceruleus complex. It's a very tiny, small little structure in the brainstem, uh, but we're able to identify it with seven Tesla imaging. Um, all right. And then many of you may have your own uh, model of a REM sleep behavior disorder in your house. This is apparently quite common. So I'm not I'm not sure if anyone if anyone in the chat wants to drop a note if you feel comfortable doing so whether or not you have a dog that does this. This is apparently I've I've talked to veterinarians before about this and described that this is extremely common. Uh, common with common dog breeds of Labradors. Um, but the, you can tell by just looking at the video that this dog is is in REM sleep. You see uh, phasic motor activity, uh, the very titch, twitches, very consistent with active um, uh, sleep. Uh, there is clearly an internal mentation that this dog is playing out. All right, and that brings it to the end. Thank you all uh, very much. Um, Dr. Thapa, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I will stop sharing my screen now. And uh, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to field them. Thank you so much for this interesting talk, Dr. Harwell. Um, I don't see any questions, um, but I do have a question. So, um, you know, you showed excellent slides and, and patients, some of them injuring themselves. So for patients like those who have severe RBD um, and as well as, you know, if they're elderly, you've already started them on high dose melatonin 15. How comfortable are you starting them on clonazepam and what's the dose that you usually give them, you know, this persists? Yeah, no, that's a that's a good question. So it you know because clonazepam is a benzodiazepine. Uh, it clonazepam itself, even in someone who has a rather robust hepatic function, is going to last ten to twelve hours. Right now, if you talk to someone who is elderly, maybe on other sedating agents, may have uh, sleep disorder breathing that is, shall we say, modestly well controlled at best. You know, are we worried about? Uh, a benzo in that population. Yes, often um, my practice with these patients has changed a little bit over the course of the last few years. I think I, what I used to do is melatonin followed by clonazepam. My strategy now is usually melatonin followed by uh, denepazil uh, and or rivastigmine. Those are the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, followed, which, which also have their own set of side effects, which are tough too, uh, followed subsequently by clonazepam. Uh, I can tell you, I've been for ten years now. I've been I've been surveying attendees at the AASM annual meeting, and particularly those who do a lot of RBD care. There is still a very strong contingent of practicing sleep specialists who just if if RBD needs to be treated, you need to treat it with clonazepam. Uh, and I think I think that's actually a defendable position. I think that's that is that that is justifiable, um, e even even amongst individuals who are older. I now I would recommend starting at a low dose. I'd start I started 0.25 milligrams, uh, and increase slowly. 
It's always a challenge with patients to get them to understand why you're prescribing it because they often really like the sedating nature. They like falling asleep sooner. They like getting up less to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. Um, and so when they come back, they're like, oh yeah, this is great. I fall asleep right away. I stay asleep. Well, I'm like, that's all fine. But are you acting out your dreams less? Or, you know, you remember you're here because you were punching your spouse and you, you know, broke your, you gave yourself a Collie's fracture, um, you know, falling out of bed. Have you, you know, what's been going on with that? Oh, I don't know. That's, I think that's fine. <laughs> that that's that's kind of a common perception on behalf of the patient, which differs from the reason why we're prescribing it. I I have two quick questions. One is, um, who's the youngest uh, that you've uh, treated that you've diagnosed with RBD that's independent of uh, narcolepsy? In other words, uh, your typical RBD. What's the youngest age? Um. So the the youngest age, I've certainly seen um, those who were adolescents, they didn't have narcolepsy, they had a lot of disorders of arousal, and they also had they also had REM motor activity. So it was one of us, it was a it was it was a sleepwalking, sleep eating, sleep texting type story. Um, you do the study, they also have REM motor activity. And that's we, you know, you call that parasomnia overlap disorder. Um, is is that RBD or not? I don't. It's that's that's hard to say. Um, oftentimes, those people are also all on an antidepressant medication. So, but if you were to ask me, what's the youngest person I've ever seen? No narcolepsy, no antidepressant, no overlap disorder. Probably thirty four, mid thirties, maybe. That'd be the absolute or earliest. And oftentimes, even in those cases, I'm kind of scratching my head. I'm like, you know, are we certain this person, somebody didn't give this person a course of, of Zoloft like five years ago for an eating disorder or something like that. Um, and it's just been, it's kind of been lost in the medical, you know, in the electronic medical record or so. Well, my second question is, so what's the neuro circuitry that explains, uh, I think the story is that People with Parkinson's disease and RBD who have who have tremors, the, the tremors disappear during the during the RBD. Am I making that clear? Yeah, no, that's the... right. Not only yes. So not only does the tremor disappear, but even more profoundly, the bradykinesia disappears. These are people who just, you know, very slow. I mean, you saw some of the videos. Very slowly, they don't have any arm swing. Oh boy, when they're acting out their dreams, they're thrashing, they're punching, they're, you know, they're they're moving appropriately. The reason why is that we're fairly certain these are coming, the, the motor activity is coming from central pattern generator neuronal circuits that are not going through um the the diencephalon. They're not going through the basal ganglia, uh putamen globus pallidus circuit that's not the there's a there's a there's a bypass circuit that is that is activating these motor activities these 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 um these these actions and the actions are often very primitive actions they are often um leaping jumping punching kicking um uh, it's it's the the sort of thing that that is reflexive in nature it, it tends not to require a lot of you know, uh, cognitive uh, rumination to, to kind of decide, oh, I'm, you know, this is what I'm going to engage in, that sort of thing. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, I have a comment here from Dr. Lee uh, Nodi saying, amazing lecture. I always learn so much from you, Dr. Oh, thank you. And we have another question here from one of our fellows, Dr. Ruben. Um, are autonomic dysfunction related? Uh, I think related to uh, RBD. I had a patient who dreams that she urinates and will wake up to find her bed weight. What happened several times? Is RBD always related to a dream? Um, it's it's the the it's not always related to a dream that patients remember. My my guess is if you were able to go inside their brain the moment they were doing it, you would see that they're activating something that they are meditating about. That, that their their cognition is ruminating about. Um, the the question doesn't ask doesn't say whether or not the patient who is having the nocturesis 
also has RBD. In my experience, that's actually quite unusual. Most most of my patients do not have uh, do not have noctoresis or any enuresis. I mean, no, she did not. Okay, yeah. So I would I would guess most enuresis most patients with enuresis, uh, in this case, secondary enuresis, um, do not have REM sleep behavior disorder. I would I would go looking for something else above and beyond that. Any other questions? Feel, please feel, feel, feel free to unmute yourself. Um, if you have any That's a good question. Oh, Hi. Thanks so much, Dr. Howell, for a fantastic talk. This is Lauren Tobias. Um, so I was just wondering um, if you might comment for non-neurologist sleep specialists on when you feel it's appropriate to refer to neurology. Um, a lot of these patients that we see with isolated RBD, but not any diagnosis yet of an alpha synucleinopathy, we refer to the, you know, the Yale Movement Disorder Center just for a baseline evaluation. But if they have no constipation, their their smell is fine, no orthostasis, any of that, um, you know, is there any anything further you would suggest be done in this the context of the sleep clinic for screening, or do you think all these pe people really should get plugged in with a neurologist um, for an evaluation once RBD is diagnosed? Um, great, great question. And just to add a level of confusion to it is looks like patients are more, if you have someone with RBD, you cannot, you, you, we don't even know for sure that they're going to be developed PD. They're just probably as likely to develop dementia with Lewy bodies, which is more, which is more difficult to identify. It's often identified even later because it's a cognitive, not a motor problem. Um, I would, I, I can tell you what I do in practice, which is, I mean, I've, I'm I'm involved with these these research studies, so more often than not, you know, I'm kind of I'm approach I'm giving them the option to kind of engage in clinical research. If they're not interested in that, if this is just kind of a straight clinical care question, uh, if they don't, I you know, after you have the conversation about there is a relationship between the risk of this and other ongoing conditions, no, I don't I don't refer everybody onto onto neurology. Um, I think it's really we we need to be very careful because I think uh, we are we are telling people something which is terrifying. Um, we need to be incredibly um, careful that you know for individuals who may have suicidality that you don't appreciate that this could push some people over the edge. Um, I do I do have a conversation with them of what we know about disease modification. The strongest evidence we have on disease modification for the prevention of dementia are, um, is, is uh, tr I, I, if you have depression, treat it. If you avoid head injuries, uh, smoking cessation is a good idea, taking care of hearing. So if there's any hearing loss, make sure you individuals get a hearing aid. Uh, and then I always have a conversation about exercise, aerobic exercise, the site of the type of exercise where you're sweating. So I, I tell patients, get to the point where you can sweat for 30 minutes, three times a week. And that, for a lot of people who haven't gotten exercise in decades, that's hard to do. And I try to be sympathetic for that and just kind of give them ideas on how to build up to that. Um, but I think it's it's a way for them to kind of take um, a little agency with the with what they're going through, which is as you, you know is is you know they're, you're you're faced with this thing that you feel like you have where you have very little to no control over. Um, and so, and I know I'm, I'm over the, the, uh, three o'clock hour, but, um, thank you for the question. Yeah. Uh, quick question. Why did you mention, um, you make them exercise until they sweat? Uh, well, this, the, the most compelling evidence that I've seen at this, so there's, we know that exercise is particularly the strongest evidence we have that aerobic exercise, um, is neuroprotective is, is in early Parkinson's disease patients. And it's it's a little tricky because exercise itself releases dopamine. So if you ever see someone with Parkinson's disease, put them on like a stationary bike for 20 minutes and then look them in again. They look fantastic. But it's it's more than just symptomatic treatment. It's more than just the dopaminergic. It does appear you are helping to prevent uh, neurodegeneration. You're helping to pr protect neurons. Um, and I say I say 30 minutes of sweating because for in large part, that's a, that's kind of aspirational for a lot of people who are not used to doing that, but it's also something that you understand when you've done it, right? Um, 
A caveat is that these people often have autonomic dysfunction, so they may have difficulty sweating. So that makes it challenging. Uh, but for people who are perfectly capable of sweating, that's kind of the goal. Great. Thank you. Um, and I don't see any further questions. Perfect on time. Thank you so much for this fantastic talk, Dr. Howell. Um, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you all. Best wishes. Thank you.